Hey everybody, it's Brian, and this is our 21st video on C++. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion on classes, and I'm going to show you how to build classes in external files. Now you notice off to the right here we have these little folders like header files, resource files, source files. I'm going to show you how to use those, and this is pretty standard at C++, not just Visual Studio. So you can um, add a new class, and let's see, uh, C++ class. Now you want the name of your class, a .h and a .cpp. What are these? .h is a header file. .cpp is a C++ code file. So let's just say cat. You notice how in Visual Studio it automatically fills it in. Your editor may vary. And let's just hit finish. And you get two files, cat.h and cat.cpp. What are the difference between these two? Well, the header, the h file, this has our class in it. Remember, it's class with a name, code block, semicolon. Um, if in case you're wondering what this pragma once is, uh, that is Microsoft's version of if and if, um, you know, if not defined. And then we've got cat.cpp. Notice how it includes cat.h. We've been over the include preprocessor directive before. So what we're saying is include cat.h. So it's literally taking this file and putting it like that. Now you understand what that looks like in memory. Now what's cat colon colon? That's a namespace. You're actually accessing the cat namespace. These are called constructors and these are called destructors. What is the difference here? Actually let me get rid of that. Let's just focus on these. The constructor is called automatically when your class is created. The destructor is called when the class is destroyed. So let's just say C out and L. Oops. And uh, some of you have already probably screaming at your monitor going, Brian, Brian, you're forgetting the standard library namespace. You're absolutely correct. We'll get to that in just a second here. We've got our namespace, we've got our implementation file, we've got our header file. Now, why do you split these up? That's a common question. Why do you need an H file and a CPP file? Well, the reason is actually pretty simple. If you've worked with languages like C Sharp or Java or even Visual Basic or Python, you know that your source files can get just massive, and I mean just big, to the point they're unmanageable. Well, what C++ and I'll write C do is you have these header files, which is where you make your, your definition of your class, and then you have your code file, which is where you put your implementation. That way, instead of having one file you've got to hunt and peck for and search through and all this other garbage, you've got one file you really have to worry about as your template and one file as your implementation. And it gets a little deeper than that. When you end up building like DLLs and things of that nature, you'll actually distribute the header file, but they won't get the code file because it's compiled in a binary. That's how and why that works. Now to use that over here, let's actually say include cat.h and notice it's the same syntax no black magic going on here. And now we say uh, cat and cat. And that's all we're going to do for this one. I want to run this and show you what happens. Yeah, compiles and builds and it says creating cat. Now where did that come from? Remember we said we've got a constructor here. That's called automatically when the class is created. And destructor that's called automatically when the class is destroyed. Now, some of you out there may be tempted to do something like this. Take this, throw out the destructor, and say, well, I want to see when this thing's destroyed. And run it. And there's no call for the destructor. Why is that? Well, if you had a very sharp eye, you'll see what's going on here. It created another one. Why is that? because you're trying to access this object while it's being destroyed. 
don't do that. Destructors actually in the real world are used to release resources. For example, if you have a handle to a file or uh, say um, a TCP socket, something of that nature. All right, back to our original example here. Let's compile it, run it. Notice how it says creating cat, and then it says press any key to continue. What you're witnessing here is the creation and destruction of this object in total. I mean, it's the entire life cycle right there. Now, let's actually go in and add a few things. Let's just stick with the example we had last time, int age. And then let's create a, uh, a getter and a setter. So we will say int get age. Now, this is how we would have done it. But instead, we're just going to go back and enter a function prototype here. Now, why are we doing that? You'll see here in just a second. Bear with me. Now, remember from our discussion of function prototypes, you are giving the prototype of the function, but not the implementation. You go into your implementation file, and you'll say cat colon colon, and then get age. Now, when you do this, you're forgetting a step, aren't you? You have to give it the return type. That is how that works. See, if you forget the int, you're actually just calling a constructor for something that doesn't exist. So you say int, and then void cat colon colon set age, and there's your implementation of your functions. Let's actually just run this real quick. Uh oh, compile errors. Must return a value. Uh, yes, we totally forgot. Save our work, compile it, and sure enough, it compiles. Doesn't do a whole lot because we haven't modified the center. Let's actually modify this. Now, the thing about function prototypes is you don't have to declare a name. You can just give it a type and say int. And then you can come back in here and say int mh and say age equal mh. and it still compiles. Now, why don't you have to include that? The reason's simple. This is a prototype. The compiler really doesn't care. And you notice how it says void up here? You might have caught that earlier. Void just means that we're giving it nothing. It's the same thing as this right here. So I'm trying to walk you through these things fairly quickly without confusing you. I hope we're you keeping up. Let's say and then we can set age and we'll say 10 and then see out cat.get age all right now let's run this and sure enough it says creating cat in 10 now if that wasn't enough i want to show you how to work with pointers at the same time so let's actually there's our first cat let's create cat Oops, pointer, and we'll call it uh, zcat equal new cat. And remember to delete our reference to our cat here. Reference, I just said reference, sorry, our pointer. And let's go C out zcat. Now, when you hit dot, nothing happens. Why is that? Pointers take a special kind of access modifier where you have to point to it. There's this dash greater than. It looks like a little arrow where you're pointing to it. And then you say get age. Now, it seems kind of cumbersome, but you'll get used to it. The reason why they do that is because they really want you to understand how you're interfacing with the memory. This is on the stack this is on the heap. You can tell instantly by the way you're accessing the properties of this class. But once you run it, it does exactly the same thing. If we actually set this here, let's set age, and we'll say zcat is 2. Let's run this.
Uh oh, build errors. Illegal indirection. What is wrong here? Hmm. Ah, uh, yes. And there's our two. Now, you may be wondering, why is that an illegal indirection? Well, simple. We were saying pointer to this address and then this. Well, when you do that, that's called an indirection, meaning it's saying grab this memory address and then indirect to this part of it. So it's kind of doing it for you. I'm trying to think if there's anything else really quick here we, we should probably cover. Um, let's actually see what happens if zcat, the age, is not set. Notice how we're not setting the age in the template. Let's run this and find out what happens real quick here. Notice how it gives us some really wacky number because we haven't initialized that. Well, that'll be the topic for another tutorial, but I just want you to be aware you should always initialize your variables. This is Brian. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you found this video educational and entertaining, and see you next time.